Well, turn with me to the book of Matthew. It's been a while since we have been in the book. We took a break for summertime to address some issues of our day, issues that are very important, and every once in a while we do that for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is because, of course, we want to keep things fresh, and I I don't want people to get into something so deep and so long that they forget what we're even addressing and talking about. I really desire to sort of wake everybody up every now and again and hit on something else that's important in Scripture, and of course, when When calamities come or when trouble comes, uh, as our world has been dealing with in in the last year and a half, we do want to address those things directly, but never at the expense of going through God's Word verse by verse and walking through it together and drawing out truths as they come. One of the benefits of, well, I should say one of the safeties of going through the Word of God verse by verse is that it, it, it does not allow us to skip over parts that are difficult or to skip over parts that are hard for us to understand, and it forces us to reckon with them and to wrestle with the Word of God in new ways. And so we want to continue this morning going through the Gospel of Matthew. We return to our Messiah and King series from this book. The longer I spend in Matthew, the more I appreciate how incredible it is on so many levels. We have seen Jesus in his ministry cover much ground preaching truth, correcting perceptions of the law and of grace. He elevated the demands of his law for his hearers to show them how far short of God's standard they were. The Apostle Paul may have spent the first three chapters of Romans trying to convict us all of our sinfulness and guilt before God. But Jesus did so first in his life and teaching throughout all Israel. His standard is so high that the only hope of salvation is his own mercy and grace towards sinners. And his grace is indeed great. John 1.14 declares, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And again, John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were revealed through Jesus Christ. The law of Moses was interpreted, preached, and applied by Christ, and the law was preached by our Lord. The law that was preached, though, could not save us, but praise be to God, the law pointed us to our need of the Savior, and every word of the Scripture points to Him. The law given through Moses was fulfilled in and through Jesus Christ. He has so perfectly represented the will of God that he is called the word of God in Revelation 19.13. He so exactly, so precisely images the foreshadowing of the prophets that he is known as the coming one, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. When you read the New Testament, it is impossible not to see that Jesus is the Messiah. The only way to get around that is if you deny that the New Testament is telling the truth. Some people deny the New Testament today because it so obviously fulfills Old Testament prophecies that they assume it must have been written to give that impression rather than believing that it was merely an actual accounting, a recording, a history of events. The prophecies are fulfilled so particularly that if someone does not believe there is a God in heaven who is able to fulfill his word, you can understand how reading New Testament fulfillment of Old Testament promises would, would cause doubt and make it difficult to continue believing a lie. The only solution to the apparent prophetic truth-telling of God is to slander the writers of Scripture as having conspired together to make it all work together somehow. The problem for that narrative, of course, is the fact that the Bible was written over a period of about 1,500 years. That kind of coordination would be difficult even with the best technology of our day, especially where personalities are involved. I love reading people portions of Scripture that were written prior to Christ, especially to those who try to escape the obvious and make up fables to account for the veracity of Scripture, or in their minds, the lack of 
veracity. They have to find a way to make it untrue. If you encounter a skeptic in your travels, you can read to them some of the scriptures of the Old Testament without telling them where in the Bible it is. And you can ask them, who is this speaking of? I did this one time for a family of ours who are avid atheists. At Easter time, I had one of them read a text in, in the gathering without the name of the book or verse number. So I had printed up the text but deleted the verse and book references. I told them it was scripture but didn't say where. And so this was read. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. And we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And later in that same passage, it says, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. And I said, who is this speaking about? And immediately they all said, Jesus. And I said, okay, what part of the Bible is it from? Now these relatives in particular had, at least some of them, been to Sunday school as children, but not since then. And they reasoned with themselves, well, it must be from the New Testament. So they listed off all the New Testament books they could think of until I said, it's not in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. And when they finally learned it was Isaiah, I explained that Isaiah was written some 700 years before Christ, and they knew instinctively the text was talking about Jesus. I told them, and I can tell you that something striking about the dating of Isaiah is that we even have copies of Isaiah, which are themselves two centuries before Christ, before the Dead Sea Scrolls. A complete copy of the scroll of Isaiah was found in Hebrew, and It dates to the second century, at least B.C. So it's inescapable. It's an old text. The description Isaiah gives is so clear. It tells what will come to pass and who the Messiah is. And it did come to pass. The Messiah has come. That's the lesson for us. Now, I wish I could say that after reading Isaiah... My family all immediately believed the gospel, seeing that they had read something that pointed to Christ even before his birth, a miraculous account of what came to pass in the wisdom and providence of God. But what we often find and what I found, and I have found many times, is that even a sign from heaven will not be enough to convince one who will not humble themselves to receive the truth of God. A sign from heaven will not be enough to convince the one who refuses to submit to the truth. We need the Holy Spirit's work in our lives to soften our hearts, to awaken us to the gospel. How did you come to know Christ? Did you always know that he was who he said he was? Or did you begin by being blind to the truth, not acknowledging him as Lord and Savior? Now, there are many who don't remember ever not believing, and that's a wonderful testimony. But most people have a time in their life where the Lord saved them, and they can look back and they can say, I really did everything I could to resist knowing him. Were you like so many who made every excuse why not to believe? It's common practice to demand of the Lord evidence that he is who he says he is. Evidence beyond all the things that he's already given us. If only God would give me a sign, I would believe. As if like the prophetic words of Isaiah, he hasn't already given us all the truth that we need. And beyond the scriptures, God has demonstrated goodness to us. For many, before you believed, you, have, 
you may have had every kindness and blessing possible in this life and had not attributed those good things to the Lord. For others, you may have had every conceivable difficulty in life and did ascribe all of those things to the Lord or to his absence in your mind. You didn't thank God for his goodness, but you blamed him for your troubles. So many believe much more must be shown to them in order to believe. And it must be shown in the way that they want. The problem is when you know how much God has actually done for mankind, how patient he's been and how he's provided for us, giving us a savior we did not deserve, providing a substitute for sin. At some point, you have to acknowledge he has done more than enough. Do you believe? Do you trust him? Well, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were those who would have considered themselves to be faithful, believers in Scripture, leaders of the people. And yet in our passage today, in Matthew 12, they seek a sign that would identify him the way that they wanted him to be identified. The frightening thing about the Pharisees is that they are like so many who call themselves Christians. They are in the community of faith, but they are anything but true Christians. They have their own traditions and consider themselves to be above those around them, even thinking of themselves as great leaders. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees were in the faith, but not of it. They were really in the world and of the world. Read with me from Matthew 12, from verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. What we see in this text is that the religious leaders of Jesus' day demand excessive proof, proof beyond proof, and also demonstrated enormous pride. And we'll see that Jesus' response was they would only get a delayed sign, not the sign they were looking for, and they were only deserving of judgment. So in the first demanding excessive proof, proof beyond proof, Verse 38 says, the scribe said to him, we want to see a sign from you. And they call him teacher. It's a sign of respect, and yet it's a sign of derision what follows, as if he had not already shown them signs. The Pharisees already knew Jesus could perform miracles. It quickly became known all over Israel that he could. And we know that the religious leaders personally witnessed these miracles as well. There is really no scenario in which the ordinary people in every town knew, but not them, not the religious leaders. They were to be the ones that were in the know. They were to know everything more than others. Turn to Matthew 9 to see some of this. From verse 2. And they brought to Jesus a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to him, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, this fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed and go home. And he got up and went home. But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck. And glorified God who had given such authority to men. Jesus takes an amazing approach here. Which is easier? Jesus reasons from the lesser to the greater that the one who can heal would have authority to forgive sins. But he performed the miracle of forgiveness before the miracle of physical healing. And it was the greater offense 
the miracle of forgiveness to the Pharisees. So he let them be offended first and then perform the great miracle that would be to further offense and yet to the delight of those who saw it who were not among those trying to oust Jesus. Now look at Matthew 9 from verse 32. Another incident where the Pharisees saw this, as they were going out, a mute demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed and were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. What a grotesque accounting of the healing ministry of Jesus, to slander Christ and to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And how can we forget the issue of healing on the Sabbath? Matthew chapter 12, earlier in the the chapter that we're in today, from verse 10, Matthew 12, 10. And a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep And if it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, he will not take hold of it and lift it out. How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. You imagine a response that such to such good as that, that they desired to destroy the man, that they would desire that Jesus, they would be rid of him forever, destroy his reputation or even worse, and obviously the hatred builds up as murder in the heart. Matthew 12, 22. Another incident, then a demon-possessed man was who was blind and mute, was brought to Jesus, and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan... He is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? But if by Beelzebul I cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And verse 31, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. You remember that teaching that Jesus gave, showing the danger of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So again, the Pharisees had seen his miracles. They had been offended by both the miracles and the testimony of our Lord. In all of this, there is no indication anywhere that they had good motivation for seeing a sign. Seeing all of these signs and their response was only evil. But teacher, we desire to see a sign from you. By Jesus' response, we know that this was not genuine, seeking and inquiring, desiring a sign. We could be forgiven for thinking before Jesus' words, perhaps this time they really want to see a sign. They really want to know if Jesus is who he says he is. But Jesus' response corrects our thinking. They had already sought to destroy him. What a contrast with his disciples Think about after some difficult teaching by Jesus in John 6, we read, as a result of some of his difficult teaching, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the 12, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That is the response of the believer, no matter what they encounter with the Lord. They encounter very difficult teaching, teaching that is hard. Even they said, the disciples said, these things are hard to understand. And yet they stood by him. 
because of who he was to them. What a relationship that they had, what a love for each other. They didn't say, teacher, after numerous miracles and signs already, show us a sign. Through the ministry of Jesus, many came seeking signs, but few sought the Lord and his life-giving words. So how did Jesus respond to the men seeking a sign in this instance? Many people had come to Jesus and had seen great miracles and came repeatedly to see more of those great miracles. His disciples came and wanted to hear his teaching, wanted to learn from him. But what about these men who were neither truly seeking the miracles nor his teaching? Jesus answered in Matthew 12, 39, and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. Modern evangelicals would have been shocked at times to watch Jesus interacting with the religious leaders of his day, those who had betrayed their people. Nowadays, we feel we cannot say anything negative of someone teaching and believing error because of a bad witness. So even if they're teaching something that is false, whether through direct uh, implication of the scripture or whether we observe their life and their life is lived as a lie, we are avoiding most of the time in evangelicalism saying anything negative. We're afraid of what we call a bad witness, as if to call out sin is a bad witness. The world is watching, they say. How many times over the past 18 months have we heard people say, don't do X because the world is watching? And half the time, X is from the scriptures. Do this, don't do this. But don't do it right now, they'll say, the world is watching. And a couple of thoughts on that. God is watching, which is the most important. And also, the world doesn't pay as much attention to you as you might think it does. There's a kind of a narcissism that we have, I think, in levels of leadership at times, where we just will avoid doing something because we're so paranoid somebody's watching what we do. And like I say, God is the most important audience, and also, a lot of the time, people aren't even paying attention. But usually, the only time we are in the world's crosshairs is when we are actually doing God's will, being obedient to his word. We need more language like the language of Jesus calling out the evil and adulterous nature of our own generation. It is evil, the generation that Jesus spoke of, because the thoughts and intentions of man's heart are so continually. And it is adulterous because the world seeks after other gods and idols and anything that would fill up the heart with distractions from God and his word. When Israel had gone astray, the Lord used Ezekiel to pronounce punishment on them, that they would be scattered for their disobedience. Listen to his words from Ezekiel 6. The slain will fall among you, and you will know that I am the Lord. However, I will leave a remnant, for you will have those who escape the sword among the nations when you are scattered among the countries. Then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations to which they will be carried captive. How I have been hurt by their adulterous hearts. Now listen, this is how he defines, Ezekiel does, their adulterous hearts which have turned away from me, and by their eyes, which played the harlot after their idols, and they will loathe themselves in their own sight for the evils which they have committed for their abominations. This is the way that Jesus describes them. He describes them as evil and adulterous. And these things follow after a pattern in the house of the Lord and, of course, in the world. The problem is that in the house of the Lord, the people of the Lord are to be the greatest representation of faithfulness in response to the faithfulness of their God. But what we find time and time again is that oftentimes the church, the congregation of the Lord, needs to be purged of its evil by exposing leadership. The scribes and Pharisees were representatives of the people of Israel, and yet they had not learned the true lesson of the past. They believed that as long as they participated in the forms of religious worship commanded in Scripture, they were not idolaters. And yet the lesson for us is that you can be part of the church, but not really of it. You may not have a gold statue set up on your mantle, but you can have a gold statue set up in the mantle of your heart. 
And that is deadly. You can be among the chosen, among the called, sitting among them, walking among them, fellowshipping among them, yet without true fellowship, and yet your heart still seeks after earthly things. Your heart is as far from God as the enemies of God. This is the terrifying thing, and it will be terrifying in the last day, that there were those who were in the pews of the church who nevertheless were as distant from God as those who were in some desert region of the world, so far away from even other individuals who know Christ. It's very deadly. Earlier in Matthew, Jesus had used a similar phrase. Matthew 8.38 says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So that's another exposition of what it means to be an adulterous and sinful generation, one who is ashamed of Christ. Jesus is the focus in that passage. You can have all the religion you want. You can even be overtly charitable and giving. Look at that man. Look at that woman. How kind they are. How sweet they are with their words. And yet, at the end of the day, what is your attitude to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you ashamed of him? I mean, the world is watching. Are you ashamed of Christ? Are you ashamed of him? The world hates Christ. They hated his people before he was born. They hated him from his birth and childhood when Herod tried to destroy him until his death when they hoped to defeat him. And they hated him for not remaining in the grave. And they have hated him and his people ever since. The world is watching. Will you demonstrate your love for Christ before that watching world? At least I say, as others have said, worry because the world is watching. But maybe, maybe they're not even watching, and yet maybe if they see one who stands and says, I am for Christ, I am for his word, I am for his people, for his church, maybe they will actually pay attention. They might mock it, but some might follow your example to Christ. What will you do? Will you ask for a sign to see whether you should obey Jesus in real life? Remember the sign of Gideon. Gideon was told exactly by God what the Lord wanted him to do, and he asked for a sign. That sign was not to know what the Lord wanted from him. He already knew. But it was for his Weak, weakness of faith, and um, often we do that. We ask for a sign when we are not truly trusting. Or will you trust Jesus as the worthy son of the living God? In Matthew 16, Jesus said to the Pharisees and Sadducees, but he replied to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red, and in the morning there will be a storm today for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? We've looked at this passage briefly before, but here we connect it because the next verse says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And Jesus left them and went away. This is the nature of unbelief. You can have a great ability to discern many things in life and yet not discern what is of greatest significance. Look around, brothers and sisters. Look at what is going on in the world. We know the Bible tells us these things would be as they are and they will increase in this fashion. They will grow from bad to worse and from worse to truly terrible. How did Jesus respond? He said no sign will be given to these religious leaders. In other words, Jesus, except he says no sign will be given but the sign of, of Jonah. So Jesus actually answers the request, not with a yes or no, but with a sign they would not appreciate on this day when they ask of a sign, but it would be a sign for the ages. Not just a sign for the healing of one person, as he had done before, but for the sign of the healing of the world. But a delayed sign, 
nonetheless. The Pharisees would have to wait to see how Jesus would fulfill this sign. But it would be undeniably spoken through the world when it was time. When it had come, the world would know it. It, and, And that message, of course, later on would go throughout the entire known world. Matthew 12, verse 39. For as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the sea monster. In Luke's gospel, as he parallels this statement, he effectively says that Jonah was the sign. When it says, no sign will be given but the sign of the prophet Jonah, Luke says this, for just as Jonah became a sign, Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Jesus, speaking of his future death, speaks of Jonah's three days in the great creature of the sea as the sign that accompanied his mission to the Ninevites. What's incredible is Jonah's story does not go into great detail about the way that he preached or what he looked like as he preached to the city of Nineveh when they repented. But Jesus here is telling you that the sign of his three days in the depths was the sign for the great city that accompanied his message. Look at Jonah for a moment. Jonah chapter 3. From verse 4. After Jonah had been vomited up onto the shore by the sea monster, it says, then Jonah began to go through the city. And of course, after having this conversation with the Lord where he tells him, Go now to the city. Jonah began to walk through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now listen to the response when he does that. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. In verse 10, When God saw their deeds, that they turned away from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Jonah's account does not say anything else that he told them or what he looked like going through the city, but Jesus seems to indicate they got more than an ordinary street preacher wandering through and preaching repentance. What they somehow understood was that a man delivered over to death was yet on the third day delivered from death to give a message of repentance to the people. What did he look like after being in the belly of a sea monster after that time? What did they understand about his miraculous life? We know the words of the message are enough to save. The word of God alone is enough to save. It can have effect with no sign, and yet Jonah's deliverance is a part of their deliverance, just as in a still greater way, Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. You see, we have the word of God, but we have the necessary sign also that Christ, in fact, was in the grave and yet released from the grave. God graciously gave the Ninevites a sign Now, what of three days and three nights? This is an interpretive issue that has found healthy debate over the years. How is Jesus three days and three nights in the grave, and yet according to tradition, was crucified on a Friday and raised on a Sunday? Much ink has been spilt on this, and there are multiple solutions, but the greatest agreement among theologians is on the use of Hebrew expressions to denote the same thing. R.T. France gives an excellent accounting of the Hebraic usage of day-night pairings in Scripture. He notes that in Semitic, and he, this is a quote, in Semitic inclusive time reckoning, these do not denote different periods as a pedantic Western reading would suggest. The resurrection of Jesus will therefore demonstrate a correspondence between him and the prophet Jonah, each miraculously released from death. And he goes on to point out that the phrase, three days and three nights, occurs precisely in 1 Samuel 30, verse 12, and and it's explained there in 1 Samuel in the following verse, which literally says, today three days, or the day before yesterday. And so France explains this. The text in 1 
Samuel says there was an Egyptian who had been running for three days and three nights. And so David and his men fed him and asked him a question. And the text, the scripture says, David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, a servant of an, uh, of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. And in the Hebrew, it is literally today three days. That is, including today three days. So if it were a Sunday, let's say, and the Egyptian had said this, when would he be speaking of? He would be speaking of Friday. And so when we think about Jesus' words, it is entirely reasonable to consider a similar turn of phrase to mean the same. Now, we always know that Scripture coheres. Scripture coalesces. It agrees with itself. It harmonizes with itself. Our problem is that sometimes we have to dig a little to find out how it does that. And so that's our delight is to dig into Scripture more and study these things. There are other calculations for this that have been offered by commentators, including placing the crucifixion one day earlier than we traditionally understand it to be so that another night is included. So, for example, a Thursday um, crucifixion. And James Montgomery Boyce makes this case. And so it's not by unknown commentators that, that other views are taken. He takes a view even based on astronomy. They, they now know, going back into the first century, which dates all the different Passovers in that century transpired. And so based on whether it's a Friday crucifixion or a Thursday crucifixion, you would have to know when the Passover in fact took place and they can do that. And so he lines it up with a Thursday. And in any case, the way that the the theologians land on this, they will pick a year based on their estimation how these things work out, whether Christ was crucified on AD 30 on a Friday or AD 33 Um, etc. And so there's many different ways to harmonize these things, but we want to be careful whenever changing a a long-held tradition of the church that we have really good evidence for it. So at this point, the main issue is the correspondence with Jonah as being three days in the depths and Jesus being buried three days in the depths. There must be correspondence there in order for it to be a sign. And we absolutely have that. And the sign of Jesus would be greater than the sign of Jonah. But it would be a difficult prophecy for his people to hear. It would be very difficult to hear, in three days I will be, uh, excuse me, I will be crucified and then three days rise. Before you hear about the rising from the dead, your mind is going to be fixed on the death of your Messiah. This is troubling. Look at Matthew 16 for a moment. Matthew 16, we learn in this great passage of, even if we look at verse 15, where Jesus had said to his disciples, but who do you say I am? And these glorious words, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. This is In this passage, just shortly after it, look at verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Now look at the the response. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And you notice that Peter had the great privilege of announcing you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And just a little bit later, he is being rebuked by the Lord for denying what must come. We know that you are the savior, Lord, but how can you die? How can you leave us? And so it was a hard saying. And again, Jesus spoke to the disciples in Matthew 17 Verse 22, and while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. This was the sign it seems that no one wanted. 
The Pharisees wanted an instant sign of no significance or one that would prove to them that Jesus had a demon, that he was not operating under the power of God. And the disciples wanted to keep the Lord with them forever and worried about what would happen to him. What about us? What is the sign that we would desire? Do we desire the sign of the crucified Lord, the one who was, was made to, to have bear great shame in the world, the one who was stricken, smitten, and afflicted? Is that the one that we want to associate ourselves with? Is that the sign that we want, or do we want something more impressive to the world, something more even though I, as a believer I say, how could anything be more impressive to the world? We can get into a rut where we think we just want, as the first century leaders of the religious groups wanted, a conquering Messiah to come today and rescue us from all our troubles on earth. But can we consign ourselves to be his servants, those who trust him through thick and thin and who know that sign of his death and resurrection is enough for me. It's enough for me to live the rest of my life trusting that he will bring me to glory in the end. Well, the the Lord showed the religious leaders that they deserved nothing more than judgment. Matthew 12, 41 The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Think about Jonah. He was accompanied by a significant sign, but he was still a man and an ordinary man. Here we have Jesus Christ standing before these rulers. He was the preacher of all preachers. I, I should imagine that Charles Spurgeon would probably be loath to know that he was called the prince of preachers when he knew that Christ was truly the prince of preachers, the king of all kings and lord of all lords. The words that came from his mouth were perfection, And yet, they refused him. And so, the Ninevites would rise up against him. What about the Queen of Sheba? 1 Kings 10 says, When the Queen of Sheba perceived all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his waiters in their attire, his cupbearers, and his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. When she said to the king, then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I had come and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told to me. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I heard. We know the wisdom of Solomon through the book of Proverbs also and Ecclesiastes. We understand his, his great wisdom, such great wisdom that every nation on earth has forms of some of those Proverbs that have been given to them, that have been translated, and that have circled the world. He has such incredible wisdom that he attained to, and yet, where does all wisdom come from? It comes from the Lord. Christ himself is wisdom incarnate, and so the greater is here. Christ is infinitely greater than the greatest preacher and then the greatest wise men. Jesus had previously condemned those who refused to repent based on having observed his works. In Matthew 11 already, look there for a moment, Jesus had denounced the cities where he had performed so many miracles. Matthew 11:20. then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the miracles, if they had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? 
You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which had occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. That condemnation shows that, no, those, those cities will still be judged. They will still face eternal punishment for their wicked deeds. And yet, there is a measure of greater condemnation because the greater one has come. The coming one, Jesus, the Messiah, has come. In Matthew 12, Jesus responds to their request for a sign by saying this generation would be condemned because of the preaching of the Messiah and the wisdom of the Messiah. And so we have compounding guilt. Jesus has come. Jesus has preached. Jesus has imparted wisdom to all who would hear. And yet so many would not hear. Well, the priests and the scribes and Pharisees would believe when they finally got their sign, right? Once, you know, they, they had a delay of their plans. They didn't get that sign they wanted, but wouldn't they believe once Jesus actually was killed, executed on the cross, buried for three days, and then rose again? Wouldn't that be the story of what happens? I look at Matthew 27 from verse 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots, and sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now, the Romans, of course, did that. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who were passing by were hurling their abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him Now, if he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers also said these things. Now, maybe they just forgot about what Jesus said, right? Maybe they're they're mocking him because they didn't remember that Jesus had said these things. No, sadly, they did remember the sign that he said he would fulfill. Matthew 27 from verse 62. Now, on the next day, The day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have your guard. Go and make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. They call the one whose sign they have both remembered and seen, the deceiver. What judgment will befall those who have had so much revealed to them? The deceiver, a title for Satan and Antichrist. Let us not be those who have every evidence given to us through the word of God and through his kindness to us throughout our lifetimes. Let us not be those who have all of that and yet refuse him, his worship that he is due. Let us be those who give him all the love our hearts can muster and then repenting of the weakness of our love for him, let us ask him to give us still greater love that we might worship him in spirit and in truth and proclaim his name to the nations. Let's pray. Lord God, what blindness we have when we have been given so much. Even as we read of the leaders and their rejection of Christ, we can only look and see how many times we have refused to believe the simple things that you have promised good for your people. Even over this past season of difficulty, we have at times failed, we confess, to believe all the good that will come through your providence in these times, in these days. 
Help us, Lord, having already been given the greatest of signs, your death and resurrection, Lord. Help us to believe all the other promises of your word, and then help us to share those with all around. In your name we pray, amen.